on March 8, 2017, actor Shia LaBeouf set up a 24-hour live stream. In it, he put a flag with the words, he will not divide us, written on it. A protest to Donald Trump's controversial ideas and policies. He had done this live stream project twice before, but it had failed because random people had found the flag and vandalized it. But this time, it would be different. He set the flag up in a completely random location, hidden somewhere on a field within the 9.8 million square kilometers of the continental United States. Nothing else was visible in the frame, only plain blue sky and the flag. No physical features, no landmarks, no mountains, nothing. It was all set to fly here for four years as a symbol of resistance to the president. And there was nothing anybody could do about it. Or at least, that's what he thought. A political community on 4chan, 4chan being a rather controversial image-sharing forum on the internet, found this particularly unacceptable. They felt they had to do something about this. They had to take the flag down. What followed was probably the most intense search operation ever undertaken by the internet. How could they find the flag when there were literally no hints to its whereabouts? They had to be smart. Since it was being live streamed, they could make use of the local environmental conditions such as noise and clouds and the croaking of frogs in the background. Some people even tried to locate Shia LaBeouf himself. Using the time of the sunset, they were able to narrow down the search area to a third of the country. Some people pointed out two planes flying in the background and using the jet streams of these planes and correlating them with flight charts and aviation maps, they were able to narrow down the search area further. At night, they caught a big break. Using star maps, constellations, and advanced trigonometry, they were able to narrow down the search area to one city. The next day, a local began driving around the area while honking loudly, which would allow those watching the stream to judge the distance based on the loudness of the sound. <laughs> and soon enough, they found the flag and took it down. All this happened within a span of only 38 hours. Random people on the internet scattered all over could unite for a common goal, for a common purpose. In this, goal, in this case, the common goal was vandalism, but that's irrelevant. Organized online communities like this have popped up all over social media in the 2010s. There's a Facebook group for Bollywood fans, a Reddit community for fans of anime, a stack exchange to share computer code, and a Discord chat to discuss games. And these communities range from super mainstream to very niche. There's a subreddit called Bread Staple to Trees, which, as you see, is literally stapling bread to trees. <laughs> Each community has its own little culture, or rather a subculture, full of symbols and interests and beliefs. They're a great way of interacting with others who have similar ideas and passions and experiences. These communities have a common purpose or a shared identity. They have traditions, they have a set of rules or a code of conduct, they have a large fan base and they have a unique language, even language. Think about the word oof. You will never hear that outside the meme community on, and it makes no sense outside it. They have large fan bases, or rather diverse fan bases. They have inside jokes, they have a glorious history full of collective achievements that people work to create together. For many young people of today, like myself, these online communities are as real to me as are the real world communities around us. If I had an image to accurately represent the relationship between these communities, it would be this. On the large scale, this interconnected and tangled web forms what we call internet culture. And we all have an important part to play in it. And yet, everyone tells us the internet is a waste of time, 
that it distorts our perceptions of reality and fills our minds with immoral ideas. To truly understand the negative reaction to today's internet and popular media, we have to go back 200 years ago. It's rewind time. <laughs> In the 18th century, the novel was this radical new medium that brought literature to the common people. They told stories that common people could relate to. Stories of maids and farmers, of horses and dogs, of romance and comedy. You know, for people in the 1800s, this was their hashtag relatable. <laughs> Part of the reason for the success of novels was their inherent ability to evolve, reflecting the changes of the society they were written in. They talked about the struggles of common people and promoted social causes. For example, Oliver Twist is a work of fiction, and yet Charles Dickens was able to criticize the poor standard of living in England's contemporary orphanages. However, not everyone received the change positively. People literally complained about the addiction to reading books. Imagine that. The educated elite thought that novels were a waste of time <laughs> that distorted young people's perceptions of reality and filled their minds with immoral ideas. But wait, there's more. Reading for the longest time had been a communal activity. Books were meant to be read aloud in clubs and in libraries and in homes and even in clubs called spouting clubs dedicated to the action of reading out loud. Reading silently was considered strange, and the ability to do so meant that now you could read alone in the privacy of your own house. And for a long time, that was considered to be a fatal activity. Yes, fatal. It sounds bizarre today, because it is. The belief was that you were so engrossed in reading a book that the candlelight in your room, it, it fell over, lit the curtains on fire, and within minutes, your entire house was on flames. And then you died. <laughs> The real reason for this anxiety was that unsupervised reading meant that now you could think on your own, you could decide what you wanted to read, and you could educate yourself. But the belief was that you were so engrossed in reading that you did not think about the effect it had on you, and you allowed it to corrupt you, and that would lead to collapse of morality and a breakdown of society. Today, novels are treated as holy scriptures from a more civilized age. But the truth is, when they first came out, people were afraid of them. Who knows, maybe in 100 years, there'll be someone saying smugly. Today's kids, they don't even read the internet anymore. Back in my day, we used to actually talk to each other by texting. Providing people with the access to information is a very significant achievement for both the internet and novels. Sitting upside down in a chair in Pune with one phone in my hand, I can access literally all of human knowledge. We take that for granted today, but that's nothing short of miraculous. But the internet goes a step further. It doesn't just allow us to consume information, but rather to produce it. It has given a voice to people who didn't have one, an audience that listens and cares about what you have to say. For perhaps the first time in history, random people like you and me have the power to influence thousands of people's thoughts and opinions in the matter of mere minutes. One particular mode of expression allows you to do just that. Memes. And it's difficult for me to explain the transformative power of memes when people still ask me, what is a meme? <laughs> Let me explain. Imagine it like a square space where you can mix and match various elements of popular media. Whether it be GIFs or images or dogs or animals or behaviors, 
to create something that is yet funny and meaningful. But are memes just silly pictures of dogs and, and screen grabs of the latest Marvel movie? Well, yes. <laughs> but actually, no. <laughs> so what can you make a meme about? Your favorite celebrity? Yes. The complex political situation of French Indochina? Yes. <laughs> and the, the funny thing about this meme is that the Stonks meme was trending a few weeks back, but now not so much. And the time I made this meme, it was. And that just goes to show you how fast the internet changes, how dynamic it is. Anyways, can you make a meme about the failure of Bohr's atomic model of hydrogen? Yes. Of course. <laughs> now, one more meme. I took a long time to make this, and if the adults here in the room understand it, I will have failed. <laughs> the thing about this meme is that it, it borderlines between real and, and not, it's almost surreal. And, and it's not meant to be understood by a mainstream audience. It's reserved for these smaller niche communities. And they, these kind of memes where only the community understands them helps to create a boundary between the inside and the outside world. Memes are units of culture. They're packets of information that are propagated via the internet. In fact, I'd argue that a meme is the idea or the concept. And the image is simply the medium to express that concept. So how do memes spread? They're a perfect means of communication. They're bite-sized, easy to read, easy to understand. And we can all relate to them. And unlike most novels and news articles, they're actually funny. <laughs> and they're very expressive. They can convey complicated emotions in very simple images. And perhaps the best part about them, and I know this sounds like something the chef from Ratatouille would say, but anybody can meme. <laughs> People like you and me can harness their power. And the versatility of these memes makes them great forms of communication. They can be used as social commentary. They can dictate the purchases you make, whether it's to persuade you to, to not buy straws to save the environment, or, or a YouTuber telling you to buy G Fuel. They can dictate what you buy. They can spark discussions about copyright, and even mobilize the public against climate change. But perhaps the most important manifestation of this meme culture on real life is politics. In a way, they're a good thing to, to inform voters, to educate them about complex concepts that they otherwise wouldn't understand, and to engage them at a grassroots level. But they're a great forms of propaganda, because you can hide complex ideologies as silly, meaningless memes. This meme uses the visual <laughs> This meme uses the visual metaphor of the pointlessness of, point, of pointlessness of pointing a gun at the sun to represent the pointlessness of thoughts and prayers in fighting something as severe as the Amazon rainforest on fire. And sometimes people ask me, this discussion about internet and its culture isn't really relevant in India. That would have been correct four years ago. But following the success of Digital India and Geo, 600 million Indians are now online. With 10 million new users being added per month, India is the fastest growing internet market in the world. We've already seen the rise of an Indian internet culture, one that celebrates Indian celebrities, Indian movies, Indian news, and even Indian sports. Following major events such as the 2019 general elections, or demonetization, or the scrapping of Article 370, memes 
floor, uh, flood into our social media feeds by the million. Who knows, maybe in 10 years it'll be normal for the government to announce the formation of a new state using a meme. <laughs> and that's because memes represent what makes the internet so great. The freedom to express, to create, and to share. That square space is your canvas to get your message to the world and to ultimately change it. The internet is more than a series of static web pages, but rather a diverse ecosystem that we're all a part of. Thank you.